an event that we uh, decided to hold that's in observation of the Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization, which is beginning uh, later this week. And uh, this, this year it's being held in Cape Town, South Africa. It's the third uh, Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization. The first one was in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1974, summoned by Billy Graham uh, to discuss uh, plans for missions and evangelization uh, around the world. And, and the Lausanne Congress, among other things, signals uh, turn towards uh, a new, uh, more global mentality, I think, for uh, Christians around the world. Um, and certainly the Los An Congress, uh, by all reports, is going to be uh, more dominated than ever, uh, for instance, from, by church leaders from Africa. And uh, in light of this, uh, this uh, event, uh, the Institute for Studies of Religion decided to hold this uh, one-day symposium uh, we have uh, scholars here at Baylor and affiliated scholars with the Institute who are among uh, the country's leading experts on uh, the state of Christianity around the world. Uh, and so this morning we're having a, a panel discussion uh, about world Christianity and then I think probably most of you know that uh, Philip Jenkins is going to be lecturing this afternoon at 2.30 in, uh, in Draper Hall in room 116. Uh, about the bricks of faith, Brazil, Russia, India, and, and China. But to get going on, on our, uh, our panel this morning, I'm, I'm Thomas Kidd. Uh, I'm a uh, senior fellow at the Institute for Studies of Religion, and I also teach in the history department here at, at Baylor. And I think I'll introduce our, our panelists uh, at, at the beginning of their, of their brief talks uh, one at a time. So our first panelist is uh, Robert Woodbury, and he's the director of the project on uh, religion and economic change and an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin, just down the road. And his research analyzes the long-term impact of missions and colonialism on education, economic development, and democracy. And he's received a number of major grants from the Templeton Foundation and other agencies. And his talk today is titled, Weber Through the Back Door, Protestant Competition, Elite Power Dispersion, and the Global Spread of Democracy. I have some uh, handouts if people want them. I'm not going to focus so much on the statistics because I didn't know how many people would understand that type of analysis. Um, but they're important for uh, understanding some of the social impacts of Christianity in general and missions in particular. <clears throat> go down. Where's the thing to go down? <coughs> Oops. Okay. My talk, I'm going to focus a little bit on the social impact of both Christian missions in, in, is my special focus, but as part of global Christianity in general. Um, <clears throat> there's often a reaction to sort of the triumphalism and sometimes arrogance of the past. Um, so many scholars tend to ignore or have a sort of a, a very critical condescending attitude towards the impact of missions um, and world Christianity in general. Um, and focused on an er a narrative of destruction and blame. Um, <clears throat> but as with many things, they can be tested. So we can test the impact of missions. We can test the impact of global Christianity um, and look at it in a way that's not just tied to our narrative or which examples that we focus on. <clears throat> Another <coughs> issue in looking at the impact of Christianity and missions in general is it's easy to get lost in the diversity. So with any complex movement like world Christianity or with the missionary movement, there are lots of great examples that, we, that are laudable and lots of ones that are um, really awful. Um, <clears throat> and they're all in there together. Um, so one of the things that we can get focused on on those particular examples, but there's also a general effect or an average effect of different things, um, which uh, may be quite positive or negative, but that again is testable. <clears throat> a third danger is we can get sort of lost in the present and just look at the associations between Christianity and various things at this given time in history. But religions have been shaping um, societies for thousands of years, hundreds of years. Um, 
And there's a process where even if one religious tradition introduces something, through the process of competition, other people copy it. And it spreads, and some of the religious differences dissipate over time. Um, so if we look at the United States, there may not be a lot of differences in educational outcomes or economic outcomes or other things like that between Protestants and Catholics. Um, but that doesn't mean that both historically have had the same effect in terms of spreading mass education, etc. But um, you have Protestants who initiated certain things, but then <coughs> spread and copied through things. And we can see this um, in Latin America, in Mexico, for example, directly looking at where the Catholic Church invests more heavily in mass education and in organizing indigenous people. And it tends to be in the places where you get um, Protestant missionaries who came and you start to get converts and then there's a reaction and they transfer resources. And then over time, um, because the Catholic Church has more resources in Mexico, they do more of the education and more of the political organization, but they do it primarily in places where you have the competition. Okay? <clears throat> so when we look at, um, try, one of the ways we can look at is trying to measure the effect that missions has had. Um, so this is only one map, but I, I located the Protestant and Catholic mission stations all around the world and determined what was at each one, and then you can adjust them to match any country or province, and then you can measure their effect. Um, <clears throat> most of my talk today are going to be about the impact of, uh, effect of conversionary Protestants and its influence on the things that we consider modernity. I think there are multiple things that we could have modernity, but the, what we tend to think of modernity is a particular type of modernity, a Christian modernity. Um, in, in many, many respects. <clears throat> in particular, looking at the impact of conversionary Protestants on mass education, on mass printing and newspapers, on civil <coughs> society, on colonial reform movements, and then how that sh dispersed power from elites uh, who tended to resist these, regardless of their religious tradition. Um, and then there's long-term political consequences in terms of the economic growth and, and, and democracy. Um, <clears throat> So first looking at the impact of education, <clears throat> conversionary Protestants wanted people to read the Bible in their own language, which meant that everyone had to read, including poor people and women. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that there wasn't education before, there was. There was often quite good education and it was often tied to religion. But it tended to be among the elite. Um, and the elite tried to keep education or the best education for themselves. They were not consider concerned about educating poor people and women. But because conversionary Protestants, and I'm emphasizing conversionary Protestants, because Protestant elites who were not conversionary also tried to keep education for themselves. But conversionary Protestants wanted everyone to be able to read so they could read the Bible. And they initiate these processes. Then <clears throat> once they do it, other people also invest in it you know, because they don't want them to become a particular version of Protestant. And um, so they either invest in it with their own religious groups or they sometimes <clears throat> pressure the state to become involved in it so you can get the religious content removed. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's, it's not that the Protestants did all of it. Um, and in cases where they are a small group, they don't do all of it, most of it often, but they initiate this process. They're also important in the spread of medical education and also um, agricultural and other practical educations which had long-term economic consequences for society. Next, <clears throat> I'm going very quickly. I've done years and years looking at this all around the world. So this is just a summary of, of thing. If you want to ask about specific cases, I can. <clears throat> Mass printing. We often think that printing is a technology that if people know how to do it, they will, and that this technology ha inherently has these consequences in terms of if you know how to print and you have markets, then you will get mass printing then you will get cumulative science, then you will get the rise of newspapers and nationalism, etc., <clears throat> which is not true. Because East Asia had printing over 800 years before Europe. They had movable font type well before Europe. They had movable font metal type 70 years before Europe. And they didn't get newspapers until the 19th century. They didn't get more than 15 to 20% male literacy until the 19th century. Um, they didn't get all these consequences of printing until the 19th century when they had competition with Protestant missionaries who introduced mass printing. Again, it's tied to the idea that everyone has to read the Bible for themselves and people have to um, have a personal faith with God because only true faith saves, not a ritual, not a sacrament, not membership, group membership. So um, conversionary Protestants use printing as a means of conversion. They did mass printing, which meant it had to be cheap, it had to be widely available, and they used it to try and change people, to convert people, which created a threat and caused other people to print. So, <clears throat> um, throughout the rest of Asia, Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist Asia, Muslim Asia, Hindu Asia, etc., 
and North Africa. People knew how to print for hundreds of years and didn't do it until Protestant missionaries initiated it. They were exposed to it multiple times by Chinese, Mongols, Jews, Eastern Christians, Catholic missionaries, and Western trade companies, and didn't print until Protestant missionaries spread it, which has long-term consequences. Oops, sorry. <coughs> Um, conversionary Protestants were also crucial to the spread of civil society or voluntary organizations. Um, uh, Catholics actually initiated a lot of this in terms of cross-national networks of missions, which become sort of foundation of sort of these global uh, cross-national organizations. Um, <clears throat> but Protestants developed these sort of smaller lay-led organizations as a process of having to fund themselves, because if you don't get, um, well, for non-state Protestants, non-conformist Protestants did this, um, without the ability to tax, um, you have to instill voluntarism and charity in your congregants in order to run your congregation, or you fail. Um, they also developed sort of mass propaganda techniques for uh, revivals and other things like that, which then were drawn on for making social movements like the rise of abolitionism and temperance, um, women's rights, peace movements, various things like that in the late 18th and the early 19th century. Um, and they're directly tied with the rise of the missionary movement. They're very closely connected, um, these movements, <clears throat> and particularly in the, in the abolitionist movement. Um, and missionaries were very important in um, helping to spur uh, particularly immediate abolitionism. I could go into that in detail if you want. <clears throat> but then they spread these movements around the world. So wherever they go, they're coming out of this revivalistic social reform context, especially in the early 19th century. Um, and where they go, they see things that they think are wrong, and they mobilize against them. So in India, they mobilize against sati, where when a, a high ca caste uh, Hindu died, the wife was expected to burn herself alive on, her funeral, on the, his funeral pyre. Um, they mobilized against infanticide. They mobilized against uh, early marriage, tried to make a reform to raise the mar marriage age. The, or the consummation age to age 12, um, various things like this in India and Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Um, in response to this, you get a couple reactions. One, you get people who worked closely <coughs> with missionaries like Ramahandro and others who wanted these reforms but were a little bit leery about having people convert to Protestantism and so mobilize parallel organizations that are doing the same social reform movements but are trying to prevent people from becoming Protestant, or at least are reticent about that issue. Then you also get people who do counter-mobilization, who want to keep sati, who want to keep early child marriage, um, various things like that. <clears throat> um, it, but they borrow the same tactics, they borrow the same organizational forms, etc., which then they use to mobilize against the missionaries. In the colonial context, for example, the British, the British originally didn't want missionaries at all. They banned them. They were forced to allow them through the massive pressure campaign in 1813. Um, and once they're allowed, once they're forced to allow Protestants to print and organize and do the social reform movements, they need the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims and the other people to run their colonies. Which means they sort of have to let them mobilize against the Protestant missionaries, and most of them didn't like the missionaries anyways. There's exceptions. Some of them really did like them, but many of them did not. Um, <clears throat> so you get the rise of these social movement organizations during the colonial period that are originally anti-missionary, but then they increasingly become anti-colonial and they become the foundation for the anti-colonial movements, and they also then become the foundation for political parties. And so they are able to force the British to gradually give over power and have elections prior to decolonization, which has long-term political consequences. Missionaries were also crucial to the social movements that occurred. Um, <clears throat> now, not most, most missionaries were not anti-colonial activists. Okay? They went there, they're trying to convert people. But in the process of trying to convert people, there are things that get in the way of it, things that make people mad, um, things where people get hurt. And in order to further their religious goals, they become involved, many of them get involved in these social reform movements. Um, so the rise of immediate abolitionism is, is directly tied to the missionary movement, and it's a long process of backing into increased radicalization. Um, <clears throat> Uh, movements against forced labor, movements for land reform in India, uh, various things like that. I can go to the details. There's tons of examples of this, um, which are important in terms of moderating uh, British colonialism and uh, uh, creating the idea of trusteeship. Um, I won't go into this just because of time, but you, you, you'll see in terms of the order of where you get abolitionism. Um, the crucial issue is where you had non-state missionaries working directly with slaves. I'm just going to skip it. 
um, <clears throat> for time. Out of the abolitionist movement, you get people then organizing the Aborigines Protection Society, where they do a survey of missionaries all around the world and others <coughs> to see how colonialism happened and trying to um, moderate the abuses that happen. And this is the, the statement of purpose of the Aborigines Protection Society. To investigate what measures ought to be adopted with respect to the native inhabitants of countries where British settlement are made and to the neighboring tribes in order to secure them the due observation of justice and the protection of their rights, to promote the spread of civilization among them and to lead them to the peaceful and voluntary reception of the Christian religion. Um, in the process, they, uh, colonial officials that were really abusive often got brought back to England for, to put on, put on trial, sometimes for murder, if, as a governor heir, etc. So that British colonial officials always had to look over their shoulders in ways that other colonial officials did not, where you did not have strong non-state um, religious monitoring. Because you do get protests among Catholic missionaries and other missionaries where they're, they're state-sponsored, but these protests tend to be short-lived because the state has, and white settlers have too much power in order to punish them and remove them. So, and, and there's also not this voluntary organization form which can be mobilized into the same kind of pressure tactics. So it tends to be done relationally in terms of complaining to a particular aristocrat who makes a rule or something which isn't followed in the colonies, that type of thing. Um, so what's the impact? <clears throat> uh, I could show you statistics on education and health, but one way to look at it rather statistically is then visually. Um, so if we look at India, and we're looking at this is women's literacy rates, um, which is highly tied to Christian missions, you see the highest literacy rates are in Kerala, and then Nagaland, and then Goa, and then Mizoram, and all these places where, you know, are not the center of government, they're not the center of trade, they're not the center of very much, except for the center of Protestant and Catholic um, conversions and historic missionary activity. If we look at the same infant mortality, we see the same thing way over there in the, you know, the mountain jungle areas where there was no written language before the 1890s, um, sometimes not even to the 20th century, um, and then Carol, et cetera, have these really low infant mortality rates, which we wouldn't expect based on their other conditions. Um, so, and statistically, you can show that there's a relationship within the provinces of India or with the provinces of Nigeria or between countries around the world. Um, the impact on political democracy. I won't go too much into the details of how I measure it because this is getting into sort of statistical stuff. Um, <clears throat> but if we want to look at the impact of, say, Protestantism on democracy, we can do it in a number of ways. One way is to do sort of natural experiments, um, looking historically. And in Europe, you find that the origin of stable representative democracy is first in the northern areas of Western Europe, um, which are predominantly Protestant or where you had heavy, heavy competition between Protestants and Catholics. In areas where there was a dominant Catholic majority, in that area you tended to get democratic transitions that were very unstable, going back and forth. But then you also find that same pattern in Latin America and except elsewhere when you get this transfer of democracy is very, very unstable. Whereas in <coughs> Protestant areas it tends to be, this is not universal, but it tends to be once you get the transition it's pretty stable. And that's also true in current data, modern data. Um, <clears throat> We can also look through quasi-natural experiments. So if we look at the European settler colonies, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you compare them to Catholic settler colonies, uh, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, um, and Costa Rica, you see that on average it's been more stably democratic in the Protestant settler colonies. Similarly, if we look at Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, this is after the transition of the Catholic Church in terms of democracy, um, so the pattern is different, but you see in both Eastern Europe and the former Soviet <coughs> Union, Predominantly Protestant and Catholic areas have democratized more easily, more quickly, more stably than historically Orthodox or um, Muslim areas. And we can also look at this through the spread of Protestant and Catholic missions. I measure democracy is the average democracy between 1950 and 1994. Um, I measure Protestant missions in, in multiple ways. And then I also, um, whenever you're trying to say that Protestant missions has an effect, you have the problem of there's lots of things that could be associated with Protestant missionaries that could be an, another channel for influence. And so Protestant missionaries could be absorbing that effect, which is called emitted variable bias. Um, it could be sort of other missionaries, Catholic missionaries, it could be European settlers, it could be who colonized, because missionary, Protestant missionaries tended to go to Protestant colonies and non-colonized areas. Um, various things like that. It could be all kinds of things related to access, latitude, being an island, landlocked, settler mortality. Um, it could be something that we can't measure very well, but shapes the behavior of colonizers or missionaries' activities, like the gap 
between when they, they, they see a place and when they actually send missionaries or when they see a place and when they actually colonize it, um, various things like that. So I try and get at this in multiple, multiple, multiple ways. Um, there could also be intervening mechanisms. <clears throat> but what we see is, this is in the first column, uh, is a standard measure of democracy. This is the first page in your handout. Um, where basically it's looking at political democracy and this is like sort of the standard, uh, a standard model of a lot of the key variables that people think are important. So if you're colonized by the British or another religious liberty colonizer, which is the US, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, Denmark, um, <clears throat> you're more democratic on average. If you're farther from the equator, you're more democratic. If you're an island, you're more democratic. If you're landlocked, you're less democratic. If you have more European settlers, you're more democratic. If you have more Muslims, you're less democratic. If you had a written language prior to missionary contact, you're less democratic. Okay, once we control for the Protestant missionary variables, you see that all of them go away, except for suddenly the <coughs> Dutch are worse than Catholic colonizers. Okay, because they were a Protestant colonizer, they have early Protestant missions, but they control them like Catholics did. So they, they um, had all these ways to control the missionaries and pay their salaries, and they actually used German missionaries to try and moderate their effect in, in the Netherlands, etc. cetera. Um, so all three of these measures of Protestant missionary influence are significant. Um, when we add the Catholic ones, they're not. It's not, it's not that they're negative. They're positive coefficients, but they just aren't significant. So they're not a, a positive influence in terms of democracy. Um, <clears throat> I won't go into all the ways I try and control it. If you want to look at some of the tables in your handouts, there's many more things where I'm trying to statistically say, well, what if it's this, or what if it's that, or what if it's that, and none of them work. Um, and I have dozens more <laughs> things I've tried. Um, for those of you who are more sort of statistically oriented, if you look at the last sheet of your thing, there's one way that statisticians try and get around the problem of immediate variable bias, which is called instrumenting. Um, if you do this correctly, which you can never prove that you've done correctly, there's, there's lots of, there's assumptions that are behind it, and you can test these assumptions, but you can't prove these assumptions. Okay, just like omitted variable bias, you can never prove that there's not something that you didn't measure that's not there. But what you can show, I'll go back to the old one, um, what you can show is that um, you can't see the R squared on here, but basically this model that just has the Protestant missionary variables and the Dutch is explaining about half the variation in post-colonial democracy. So if there's something that we didn't <coughs> measure that's causing this association, it has to be like almost determinative of where missionaries go and almost determinative of democracy. Correlation has to be like 0.872. I mean, it's, it's like massive in both directions. So it should be something that's nameable. Do you, do you mean? It shouldn't be just something obscure and ephemeral. Do you mean? It's something that people are totally blinded to that is determining these things. Okay? And so you can keep going at it. But uh, I haven't been able to remove those effects um, with anything. <clears throat> so if, even if we instrument, so that's basically if you find a variable that you can argue didn't cause democracy directly, only through the mechanisms included in your model, and then you predict the values of the missionaries using that variable, and then you predict democracy using the predicted values of the missionaries, it removes the problem of omitted variable bias. Um, and you can see when we do this, I've done, some, done it different, what, dozens of different ways, um, all of the missionary variables still predict democracy positively. Um, so this is a pretty rigorous uh, statistical uh, test of the impact of missions um, on democracy. And if you want me to go more in details, I will. But I don't want to take too much time. So <clears throat> I wouldn't claim that conversionary Protestantism and the, the impact that it's, the, the, how it shapes the behavior of others through competition, because it's not all them that's doing it. It's what other people do when they face this competition. Um, it's not the only cause, but it's in a very important cause, it seems like, and it's also one that's neglected. Almost no one talks about conversionary Protestantism or missionaries or religious liberty and democracy. Almost nobody. Actually, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> I do. Some people are starting to. Um, but anyways, that's not what normal people talk about when they talk, how do we promote democracy? That we need to establish the religious liberty so we get religious competition. They don't say that. But I would argue that. Um, it also doesn't mean that conversionary Protestants are perpetually necessary. Once they have spurred these changes, it's changing the class structure and that changes the incentives of people, okay? Um, so it's not like 
conversionary Protestants are the ones who are doing all the democratization activity. They're not. It's spurring these changes in printing. It's spurring these changes in newspapers, in, in mass education, in civil society, and other things like that, which creates resources for non-elites that can pressure for the expansion of power. Um, it's also crucial to understand religious incentives. So, for example, with printing, it wasn't just knowing how to print. People knew how to print for hundreds of years and didn't do it. Because they have economic and political incentives for people not to have books. They want to keep control of access of text. They want to be able to control the interpretation of text. It's only when you get this non-economic, non-political incentive, religious incentive, that undermines that, that it gets the expansion of text, which then they have to compete in the market of ideas against. Um, so these, this religious competition is in crucial in shifting elite incentives, incentives in bridging uh, classes and undermining um, the monopoly of, of political and economic elites. Because one thing that political and economic elites cannot monopolize is souls. They can control the vast majority of land and resources and political power and education, but they cannot monopolize souls. And when one group is abused by whoever's in power, they're more likely to convert. And so then when missionary groups go in, they go and they work, and those are the people who convert, which then forces them, if they want to keep those people, to transfer resources to work with the non-elites, with long-term effects on class structure. Um, this is not more a sociological thing, but a lot of people tend to favor material causation and sort of put cultural causation as sort of soft, weak, flabby, not really important. Um, <clears throat> but I would argue that like yin and yang, <coughs> class structure shapes religion, but religion shapes class structure as well. Um, they each shape each other. Um, and many people have criticized Weber. They think that he's wrong, and I would argue probably some of his mechanisms are wrong. But I think his intuition is right, that religion has profoundly shaped what we consider modernity, but maybe through a different mechanism, through a different door. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, Virginia Gerard Burnett, and she's an associate professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin. She's the author of uh, Terror in the Land of the Holy Spirit, Guatemala under General Efrain Rios Mont, 1982 and 1983, which has just come out from Oxford University Press this year. And also Protestantism in Guatemala, Living in the New Jerusalem from the University of Texas Press in 1998. And she's co-editing the Cambridge History of Religion in Latin America with Paul Freston, who's also here today. And her talk today is The New Religious Worlds of Latin America. Let me close. Can blank this so yeah. don't have to actually, actually go back line. to Bob's map. I like that. I <laughs> go the back PowerPoint to the map. And I like that map. So <laughs> okay, that's the, like the third slide or yeah, second slide. Yeah. <laughs> can we go seriously? I okay. like oh, that map. You so want to go to the yeah, map? Okay. I'll, I'll get it. A couple of things. It's actually a professor of history. I need to update my website, I guess. Uh -huh. But um, I want to say a few things. Number one, thank you for inviting me, me to this. Uh, followed the work of this institute for a while, and so I'm really glad to be a part of it. And I. I'm sort of astonished that there's such a colossal divide between uh, Baylor University and University of Texas when we're an hour and a half apart, and I hope that maybe, it's probably not the beginning, I think some other things have happened, but I think there are rich opportunities for us to do some collaborative work together in ways we haven't up to now. Um, the other thing is my paper is, you know, the great divide between quantitative and qualitative? <laughs> Mine's on the other end from Bob's paper, so I want to prepare you for that. But the map is so nice, I just think we can all gaze at it. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking only about Latin America, and so there it is. So, um, the title of my paper is A New Religious Worlds in Latin America. There is a long-held assumption that Latin America is so intrinsically Catholic that using religion as a category of analysis to examine it hardly made any sense. Even this basic assumption isn't correct given the many varied expressions of Catholicism through the region, but in a broad sense it is true as Latin America, colonized by crossing crown, remained deeply Catholic if not only in terms of religion but also in terms of culture and identity through most of its history. In recent decades, however, religious pluralism, mainly the expansion of Protestantism, but also a rise in indigenous and Afro-referential religious practices, as well as an increase in secularism, have sig significantly changed Latin America's spiritual landscape. 
The purpose of this essay is to explore where we within the academy have been in understanding this phenomenon and to tentatively help chart a path for new directions in the future. As we delve into the literature on Latin America, we quickly realize that, that for quite a long time, what we as scholars basically produced were a series of narrative historical studies, most of them focused on the Catholic <coughs> Church as an institution. For example, we had important studies on Jesuit missions, on the church as a banking institution, on church-state relations, most importantly, John Lloyd Meacham's seminal Church and State in Latin America, which came out in 1934. An important exception to this institutional preoccupation was Ro Robert Richard's The Spiritual Conquest of Mexico, 1933, but even this deeply influential work was primarily concerned with the hegemonic process of conversion and the establishment of Catholicism as a colonial institution. It is worth noting that while these books both came out in the 1930s, both were reprinted with only minor revisions in the 1960s, giving us a good indication of how little the field had developed over that period of time. Remarkably, even then, there was very little assessment about the meanings, I put that in the S in, in parentheses, of lived religion. The one caveat to this is the great spectrum of anthropological studies produced over the first three quarters of the 20th century that took a close look at the various kinds of native religions. These included many works written on religious syncretism, sorry for the many air quotes, but I, 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 with some of these terms, would, I would qualify them if it were a longer project, among indigenous peoples, shamanism, and descriptive studies of the African diaspora. But even here, descriptive is the operative word, as these works were, generally speaking, overly so, offering up intricate details of religious rituals and material culture, but offering only cursory or patronizing explanations of their meaning. Well, when it entered into play at all, the scholarship on Christianity in Latin America during this period in particular was disaggregated from the kinds of theory and methods someone in religious studies, for example, would use in examining the big, what I call the big three monotheistic religions elsewhere. This perspective began to change, as did so many things in the late 1960s, bringing about a nascent effort to link Latin America into the broader theories of the sociology of religion. One broad current of interpretation of religion was Marxist, of course. During this period the, period, the field was much affected by scholars who were influenced by Marxist theory, and I avoid using the phrase Marxist scholars here, as many social scientists who adopted an economic determinist outlook were anything but political Marxists, thus reducing religion to a marker of either class, uh, economic <coughs> class slavery or simply a false consciousness. Although Marxism has generally fallen away as a political philosophy, I believe that the impact of this type of thinking remains highly influential, even pervasive, within much of the academy to this very day. As scholars in the social sciences and humanities still tend to view religion and religiosity either as a marker of something else entirely, economics or politics, for example, or as an atavistic system of ideas that continues to enchant and motivate non-modern or perversely conservative people. One important exception to this is the large body of writing that came out about liberation theology in the 1960s and 1970s. While much of this literature is expressly political, i.e. the writers are usually more concerned with liberation in than the theology end of the equation, and most of the works are produced by non-academics, which I think is probably a blessing in itself, this literature distinguishes itself for its willingness to take matters such as faith and belief seriously as sine qua non factors that guide the direction of people's lives and aspirations. At the same time, however, the rise of religious pluralism, that is Protestantism, in Latin America in the 1960s also brought new attention to the study of religion in the region. Broadly speaking, works like David Martin's on secularization theory began to update Weber, and indeed works such as this did touch on, briefly at least, on Latin America. Operating from the assumption that secularization in rapidly modernizing third world nations would follow a similar pattern as secularization in Europe and to a lesser extent North America, Martin and others discovered relatively quickly that the, the chain of theorization on secularization that linked the field via Weber all the way back to Durkheim hit a wall when it reached Latin America. The problem, of course, is that Latin America and indeed the entire global south does not look, act, or develop exactly like Europe and the U.S. S speaking simplistically and specifically, as Latin America becomes more modern and challenged by modernity, i.e. economic crises, military dictatorship, civil war, hyper-urbanization, it seems to become more, not less, religious. Obviously, there are many ways to complicate this observation, and we probably should. For starters, we can call into question, as all good postmoderns do, the meaning and chronotopic pace of modernity, a task that has occupied a good many of our college and, colleagues in the social sciences and humanities in recent years.
Setting aside these qualifications for the moment, though, we need to turn to the context for this reassessment, which was the rapid rise of Protestantism in Latin America <coughs> beginning in the 1960s and exploding in the 1980s and 1990s, parale paralleling similar explosions in Africa and Asia, of course. Within Latin America, the apparently sudden and unexpected conversions of tens of thousands of Latin Americans to Protestant and specifically Pentecostal churches was largely ignored by the academy at first, save for two pioneering studies, one by Christian Lalief Depany and the other by Emilio Willems, both published in the late 1960s and both on Protestantism in the Southern Cone. Both authors basically adopt modernist, desarrollista, that is, development-oriented interpretations. The title of Debony's work, Refuge of the Masses, for example, gives a good sense of their approach. The Protestant churches provide a simulacrum of familiar, if authoritarian, social structures in time of transition. But they also place the issue of religious pluralism and indigenous, that is to say, local Protestantism, contrasted with the kind of missionary churches that Bob was talking about on the table for the first time. As we have noted, the 1970s through the 1990s witnessed a dramatic rise in Protestantism in Latin America. Countries such as Guatemala and Brazil were among the first to claim and take note of the fact that their countries were suddenly home to large Protestant minorities. In the early 1980s, in fact, many church growth experts were predicting that Guatemala, which infinitely had a, infamously rather, had a Pentecostal and genocidal general in power between 1982 and 1983, would be Protestant majority by the year 2000. The fact that this prediction did not come true does not obscure the fact that by the millennium, Protestantism, and especially Pentecostalism, had become dominant features on the spiritual landscape of Latin America in many countries, and a significant factor in social, political, economic, and indeed religious behavior. Speaking to this latter fact, we point to the dramatic expansion of charismatic Catholicism during much of the same period, a response to the Protestant threat that has enhanced revitalized Catholicism in much of Latin America today. Yet it took social science a fairly long time to notice this. As David Stoll once noted, when, Latin America, when, when they look at Latin America, academics want to see priests urging their faithful to social justice. They don't want to see Pentecostals in a concrete church with a bad sound system. <laughs> David Martin has called this a, a forbidden revolution. This all changed, however, in 1990 when two key studies were published, one by David Martin himself, Tongues of Fire, and the other by the very same David Stoll in his book, Is Latin America Turning Protestants? Martin's gaze in particular is a noted sociologist of religion who had never before looked intensely at Latin America, marked an important turn in the field. Their work, along with a series of country-specific studies, which came out shortly thereafter, inspired a new current of work that sought to examine Protestantism in Latin America, not just descriptively, as it has, had largely been the case before when it happened at all, but theoretically and even occasionally phenomenologically. By decades in, many rich, rich and nuanced studies of this type had begun to appear. It's almost ironic that it took this close reading of Protestantism to ultimately push back the field to an examination of Catholicism <coughs> using the same theoretical lenses as had been burnished in the Protestant studies. A good example of this is the research of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, Paul had a part of this, which conducted a 10-country survey of religious attitudes and behavior in Latin America in 2006. This survey provides a rich trove of data and is instructive in many ways, not the least of which is the matter of classification. Pew can place the category of Protestant Pentecostal and Catholic Charismatic to a single category, renewalists, thus suggesting that commonalities between these two groups are greater than their primary linkages to their own denominations. In a manner of speaking, by Pew's reckoning, Latin American renewalists are not only postmodern, they're also post-reformational. As the field of religious studies in Latin America has expanded, it has been, of course, deeply influenced by theoretical developments to the north and has been folded into various emergent theories, all with their apostles and their detractors. First among these would be Stephen Warner's new paradigm, the religious marketplace theory, which has been much more fully developed by Rodney Stark and Roger Finke and applied to Latin America with varying degrees of nimbleness by scholars such as Andrew Chestnut and Anthony Gill. There are those, of course, who have problems with the theory, in part, I think, because the language of the marketplace jangles so badly in their ears to references and the ideas of the holy. But one of the many assets of this approach is that it doesn't disaggregate Latin America out as a separate case from North America or Europe or, Af or Africa. Instead, it presupposes that the same kinds of theoretical metrics can be used, can be somewhat universally applied, a genuine formulation for scientific testing. <coughs> Even more significantly, a, 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 
or more recently, excuse me, a, a significant current of emerging literature on religion in Latin America has to do with contextualizing religion's role in rapidly transnationalizing and globalizing societies. Although this approach has some reference back to the Marxist style essentializing of religion's role, I think this is a use, think it is useful in ways that it helps us to stretch our minds across borders, de-regionalizing religious phenomenon as the religions themselves have always done. We should not lose sight of the fact that the Roman Catholic Church, of course, was the first truly transnational global organization in the modern world. Um, <clears throat> the transnationalist model also helps us to see how religious identity can both transcend and help construct identities and boundaries that have little or nothing to do with the nation state. In other words, transnational religion is a form of social networking. This is obviously not a, not a new idea in itself. Stark, Putnam, and others were writing in these terms a good 10 years ago, but to use transnational so social networking as a social organizing principle, or excuse me, as an organizing principle can, I think, be especially useful in helping us out, sort out several things. First, religious behavior, that is, re live religion. Two, identity construction and three, survival strategies in a globalized cultural milieu. It helps explain why transnational global religion, whether its influence <coughs> is benevolent or pernicious, can help accomplish religion's basic function, to order, render, and meaning out of a chaotic universe. But all of this skirt, still skirts around the larger meaning of lived religion for the people who actually do live it. Ordinary people in Latin America, as in any place, may indeed have ulterior economic, political, social, social cultural reasons for going to church. Uh, recent scholarship by David S S Smildy, for example, updates this functionalist argue, view by arguing that people convert or become religious mainly as a strategy of forward-looking personal improvement, something he calls imaginative rationality. But to suggest that these are the exclusive or even their primary motives for religious behavior ignores the fact, in my opinion, that people usually perhaps even only sometimes make religious decisions or engage in religious behavior for religious reasons. These are choices they make on their journey in the search for the divine. I would argue that these two paths do not necessarily detract from one another. As Smiley suggests, there is no natural distinction between religious and non-religious goals, as, and particularly in the minds of believers, both contribute to the life abundant. This is a strong subject, of course, to some of the ideas that Philip Jenkins raises in the New Christendom and further develops in his New Faces of Christianity, Believing the Gospel in the Global South. Jenkins' central idea is that Christianity, despite its long association as a Western European faith, is not by definition or origin an imperial religion at all. According to Jenkins, Southern Christianity, stip, slipped, uh, excuse me, stripped of its colonial trappings, is both more biblically conservative but also more vigorous than its counterpart to the North in the U.S. and especially in the Europe that was once known as Christendom. And Jenkins' work, as we know, has some detractors, especially among those who find his book to be a Christian tri have a cri Christian triumphalist tone, see, 1960s above. But Jenkins' notion that the global North and global South are mirror inverse images of one another in terms not only of religion's practice but its actual meaning is richly provocative. At the very least, this analysis turns ideas about religion and colonialism on its head and provides a strong sense of agency on the part of people in the global South. I myself have been very deeply influenced by this line of thinking, so my current work, which has been supported in part with a grant from the Templeton Foundation, sets out to test some of Jenkins' observations firsthand. I'm interested in the kinds of what Walter Mignolo calls barbarian theorizing we see in Latin American Christianity, not just new movements such as Pentecostalism, but oh, we lost the map. But also, um, my, I'm also very much interested in what happens within Catholicism, too. We don't have much time to go into it here, but I'm very much interested in what happens when modern Christianity is reinvented and sometimes sent back to us from Latin America. I do not have the specific training to approach this from a strictly theological perspective, but I am deeply intrigued by the ways that Latin Americans today are decolonizing Christianity. My current research has to do with the ways in which indigenous people have been able to appropriate, uh, and by indigenous I mean larger than just Indians, I mean Latin American people in general, have been able to appropriate a powerful discourse of dom denomina uh, excuse me, domination, colonialism, and subordination, that is Christianity, and inverted both the means and the message for their own strategies for survival in a mo modern or postmodern social and political milieu. It focuses on the ways that in recent ways, roughly since the 1960s, Christianity has, bega has begun to develop a vernacular hermeneutics. That is how North Atlantic Christianity has in some sectors of Latin America lost its imperial colonialist, colonialist associations 
and has been appropriated by heretofore marginalized and subaltern, pe subaltern people for their own purposes. My work interrogates the emergence of global Southern Christianity from four vantage points which reflect the evolution of four distinctly culturally bounded theologies. Although I doubt I have time here to go into the four case studies, and in fact I don't, uh, I'm providing a short <coughs> synopsis of the chapters of my ongoing project below. And I'll just tell you what they are. I'm, I'm working on a chapter about um, enculturation theology, which looks at issues of identity and cultural resurgence among indigenous groups in Guatemala and Bolivia, and explodes their efforts to de-Christianize um, Christian theology, that is to decontextualize Christian narrative from their Western cultural references, and to reposition them within uh, Maya and Quechua, Telos, or, or Cosmovisions. Um, that's one chapter. A second chapter is um, Spiritual Warfare, which I look at. Most of my work's been on Guatemala, so you see there's a Guatemalan reference in almost every single one. Colombia and Mexico, as I'm sure everybody here knows, Spiritual Warfare is a very aggressive theological approach in which the Pentecostal armies of God quite literally cast out the demons which pla plague modern society, um, which I argue is a very adaptive strategy that's very malleable to local conditions and its discursive elements are often directly related to the most volatile cultural fault lines in a given society. And I use examples, for example, um, in Colombia, spiritual <coughs> warfare directly attacks narco-trafficking and, um, and murder. In the United States, of course, it's very often engaged with sexual politics such as um, homosexuality. Um, in the cases I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, the context of Guatemala, Colombia, and Veracruz, Mexico, and I think one of the elements that's most interesting is the way in which in Mexico uh, spiritual warriors take on uh, witchcraft, which has become very popular in the drug, drug trade. A uh, third case study I'm looking at is Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, which is a Brazilian megachurch which is expanding very rapidly around the world. In fact, we could put up a similar map of the IURD. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm looking at it um, in Brazil and in the United States, where it's sending out large-scale missionaries. I'm interested in a couple of things there. One is it's what I call a plastic theology. It studies the market in a given place and adapts it to that place. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of reverse missionaries. Um, to places that used to be sending that are now receiving countries. And I'm also interested in uh, prosperity theology, which is certainly not unique to the IURD, but is certainly a hallmark of, of, of their outlook. And then the fourth case study I'm looking at is Cuba, uh, the house church movement in Cuba, which has modeled itself on the expansion of covert Christian churches in, um, in China. Uh, but well, that piece of the project has not been all that, that fruitful. One of the things that has been most interesting is, is the number of young Cubans who have come into Christian churches with absolutely no prior understanding of Christianity at all. They don't know anything about it. They come in completely cold. Uh, and how they are producing a, a, a kind of Christianity that we might not uh, always recognize. Um, anyway, there are any number of directions one might go in concluding this essay, not the least of which is to observe that Christianity is no more static in Latin America than it is elsewhere in the world. While it is currently contracting in Europe and the Middle East, it is expanding and revitalizing in places like, Latin, like Africa and Latin America. Although the lens of analysis may change, I would challenge us all to take an ever closer look at what is happening to modern Christianity when it, to use a rather objectionable colonialist term, goes native. Um, as we retrain our eyes to look from north, south to north and from colonists to colonized, and as we learn to erase the geopolitical boundaries from our minds as we consider how religious ideas, people, and institutions flow and interact transnationally without regard to traditional channels of power and authority, we've moved by necessity beyond some of the binaries that bounded our earlier thinking on religion, such as those that divided rationality and irrationality, sacred and profane, science and faith, modernity and underdevelopment, truth and heresy, religious and secular. <coughs> and even as we scholars try to abandon these old verities, they continue to inform our cultures, including our religious cultures in both the North and South. Indeed, at least some of the theological positions that come out of the new churches of the Global South directly challenge this abandonment of such certainties. Thus, <clears throat> when we as post-colonials look into the inverse mirror of religion in Latin America, what we see is not at all unfamiliar but rather something that is, again, main mood. So, thank you.